My name is Brent Yates. I'm the CTO of Hellestorm. We're an Atlanta-based company that spent the last seven years developing IP that goes into hardware acceleration devices like FPGAs to accelerate cloud-based services and software. And we're focused heavily in this area of containerization, microservices, and what kind of things can you do to accelerate that. So building off of what Neil said, we want to talk about how we can change the economics around building these infrastructures. So it's not the economics of what you charge customers. This is the economics of how do you build the infrastructure to serve these customers based on your future growing needs. So we're talking about server infrastructure, physical hardware. Uh, it can be on premise, in the data center, or even at the edge. And they all have slightly different characteristics. But one of the main things they share is we need greater efficiencies. So I'm going to talk to you about how we can get those greater efficiencies. Uh, we need lower power usage. Power is a big concern. Uh, in countries where you're doing carbon trade-offs, it's a very strong economic concern. And we want to squeeze that down, especially at the edge, to get more efficiency and use less power. And then the most important thing, I think, from our standpoint is we want to maintain that flexibility. You've seen over the talks of the last uh, several hours that this is a rapidly changing environment. We're changing from the way HTTP 1 works to HTTP 2. There's already a spec for HTTP 3. We talked about three different variants of TCP and dynamically changing that based on loads. This is a rapidly evolving area, and you've got to be able to maintain that flexibility. You can't just throw one solution in now and eat the cost of that when you have to switch it out a year from now which all goes back to your return on the investment. So when you're building out these networks, you want to optimize that. So we can't really talk about hardware without talking about software first. And Neil did a great job of, of building on this, is that the way software is being developed is changing. Everyone's going to the cloud, but the cloud is not a physical place. It's just a way of doing software, of building these microservices, of designing for the problem, not for the hardware you're running the problem on. So software designers want to be able to build a piece of software and define what the requirements are and then have that run on whichever server it happens to be without having to know what OS is on it, how much RAM is on it, how many drives are on it, what processors are on it. Those are secondary concerns. What they care about is solving the business problem. And so it seems straightforward that that's the way it should be, but it took us a long time to get to the perfect storm of having all the features to be able to build that kind of system. So now with these automated orchestration layers and languages and tools, you can do that. You can focus on solving the problem and let the automatic rules throw your software out at the edge. And in this case, out on an edge that is a service provided as part of a, of a CDN. It gives you a couple of good features. You can, it's easier to manage because you're focusing on the problem, not the hardware. Uh, you can have heterogeneous server deployments where they have different hardware requirements, but the programmer doesn't have to know that. The software automatically figures out where to run it on in the most efficient way. And it allows you as a business to focus on the problem and quickly adapt to changing uh, concerns rather than having to focus on hardware deployments. Um, just to reiterate, the cloud can be public cloud, like Neil said, or a hybrid, or in this case, a unique way of expanding the cloud out to edge nodes. And it all takes advantage of these high CPU core counts by breaking up the software from the big monolithic application. I'm pointing to Neil's slide from the, the second one he showed, where he had the big monolithic application and then broken up into microservices. Um, those lightweight micro applications make it easier to adapt to your business logic, and it also uh, means that there's a lot more of them. And there's an overhead. There's a friction with having thousands of microservices on your server, but that friction is outweighed by the efficiencies you gain in breaking your application up that way. So why do you want to add specialized hardware to this type of deployment? Why not just throw it out there on regular Intel hardware uh, with 72 cores and just let it run? Well, the reason is that CPUs are not increasing based on Moore's Law. Moore's Law is dead. We're only getting about 3.5% improvement year over year on CPU performance. So you throw these things out there in your container, you're throwing more services, more problems, more chatty apps, but the only way you get faster is waiting 10 years for CPUs to change or throw more servers at the problem. And throwing more servers at the problem is both capital intensive, but it's also wasteful. It's not green. It's, it's a power problem. And Microsoft can afford to spend $9 billion on data centers, and Google can spend $10 billion, but those are big capital deployments, and it'd be much better if we can make efficiency changes and change the way we do business instead of just throwing servers at it. So specialized hardware can do that. 
So we, we kind of look at it as a capacity gap problem. So on the bottom, the blue line is CPU performance. The red line is demand. Pretty much everyone we talked to and we've been going around the room today is talking about a 30 to 35% year over year gain in how many streams they have to provide, how many apps they have to run, how much data they're putting out. And the only way to solve that gap is to fill it with servers. So we believe that putting specialized hardware in your server is a way to get back on Moore's law. And more specifically, putting in reconfigurable hardware is a way to keep you on Moore's law. So disaggregation of large monolithic software processes into microservices is required. That's the way everyone's going. Containerization is the future for software deployment. It's the only way to take advantage of the high CPU counts, and it's just a better model for software development. So we're already going that way. Specialized hardware is really the only way to improve the performance of a single server significantly. You can wait till the next CPU variant comes out and gain a 3.5% improvement, but if you throw specialized hardware, you can gain a 2 or a 3 or a 4x improvement on those tasks. And MIT did a study where they were looking at the cost of producing specialized hardware versus the savings that you get in using it. And they were looking at building specialized hardware the, the expensive way, building your own ASIC, spending millions of dollars and years to do it. But even at that, they determined that just a 2x improvement in performance was worth those costs. And what we're proposing is to use chips where you don't have to invest the millions of dollars and get better than 2x improvement. And based on their, their study, the return on investment is far exceeded. And reconfigurable hardware is the only way to remain flexible. If you build a single application-specific integrated circuit that does one thing, that's what it's going to do. And two years from now, you're going to have to do it again. So let me briefly talk about the different types of acceler hardware acceleration. You're probably already used to the ones in the upper left, which is a CPU and a GPU. Those are software-driven pieces of hardware that do task. And within those blocks are specialized hardware. GPU obviously has specialized hardware to do graphics processing and lately to do AI processing. But even inside your CPUs over the years, Intel has added more and more specialized hardware to do certain functionalities like floating point or uh, encryption, AES encryption. The problem is that you don't have any control over what those blocks are. You just have to wait on them to add them. And at the far right end is an application-specific integrated circuit. Think of it as something like a NIC, a network card, or a RAID controller. It does one thing, and it does it very well, and it's very efficient. But that NIC or that RAID controller can never be anything other than a NIC or RAID controller. It can't be a GPU. And then you have that strange thing in the middle, the field programmable gate array. That's the chip I want to focus on, because it's a piece of specialized hardware that can be a NIC or a RAID controller or a GPU or a CPU. It can be all of those. It's up to you to decide what you want it to be. So an FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. It's basically a big sea of gates. And it doesn't do anything until you program it to be a specific type of hardware. But it gives you a lot of flexibility. The problem is that flexibility comes at a great cost. They're very hard to use. It takes a long time to, to gain the skills to do it. So what we need to do is have an FPGA that provides services that some regular software people can use, but doesn't require specialized teams of people to build it. And I said esoteric piece of hardware, but the reality is that FPGAs are big business. They're not unusual, and you're going to see them more and more in the future. Uh, Microsoft is using FPGAs on every single server they put on their Azure network. They've already realized that they need that hardware flexibility and that acceleration. Amazon provides FPGAs in their F1 clusters for people to use. Intel just bought Altera, or a couple years ago, bought Altera, the second largest FPGA vendor, for $17 billion specifically to push FPGAs into the data center. And then Xilinx, the current largest FPGA manufacturer, has uh, recently published that they think it's a $6.6 .6 billion market for FPGAs in the data center. So this is not a piece of technology that's going away. It's a piece of technology that you're going to see more and more. And we believe, like Microsoft, that it's going to become a core part of every server put out at the edge. And the reason is it's your only way to get those massive gains on performance. However, unlike Microsoft, you probably don't have a team of specialists and PhDs to understand how to use these chips. And to paraphrase the CTO of Dell, we believe in order for this to become mainstream, you need to make your reconfigurable hardware transparent. It just needs to be there like a NIC or a RAID controller that software people know how to use, not a piece of 
esoteric hardware that's a sea of gates that you've got to figure out how to make it work. So how do we do that? How do we make it valuable at the edge? Well, we came up with, similar to Asimov's three laws of robotics, we have the three laws of reconfigurable hardware. The first one is, do no harm. You can't change the way software programmers work. They don't like that. They don't, they don't have time to learn these weird esoteric skills. So you have to make it operate the way they're used to. The second is, the, soft, the reconfigurable hardware needs to provide services, not a sea of gates. It, doesn't, it needs to obey your orders, not be something that you have to spend years programming. And the third is, it needs to be adaptable. So cause no harm, provide something useful, and be adaptable to changing market conditions. And if you follow those rules, you can take advantage of this type of, of acceleration. So I keep talking about services that hardware can, can supply. What kind of things are we talking about? What does a typical microservice that Neil was referring to do? Well, typically running in the CPU is your application logic. It's the core of what you're trying to solve. But in there, you're going to have local storage. You're typically going to have some kind of global storage because remember he was talking about they're going to dynamically spin this container up on whatever server is most appropriate. That server is not going to have your data. The data needs to be in some sort of global share across all of your network. Uh, obviously, you're going to be on a network, which means you're going to be following TCP protocol, TLS, encryption, HTTP processing. Those are typically services that you see. Uh, a lot of times, there's a virtual network switching layer to connect your microservice to the rest of the system. You've got inter-process communications. You've got logging. You've got diagnostics. The CPU is doing a lot just to run a container. And that's where you run into the problem. The CPU is churning, doing all this. So what can we put into the reconfigurable hardware side? Well, we believe we can put almost everything in there. And we can make it like a menu where you choose what services are important for you in your application. So the CPU still runs your business logic because that's the core of what you do and it's, it's not copyable across multiple ones. And it might possibly have a little bit of local storage. But imagine now that hardware is now implementing the global storage with no CPU overhead. And hardware is implementing the network processing with no CPU overhead, as well as inter-process communication, security filtering, uh, logging, diagnostics. We can monitor every one of those applications in hardware and keep track of them without loading down the CPUs. Now, all of a sudden, your CPUs are free to do the things that's important to you, which is your business logic. And they can do it more efficiently with less power and fewer number of servers at a given location which is important when you talk about expanding the geographical footprint of servers across the edge. So how do we do that? I'm not sure you can see this if you're far back, but imagine that the big red block is full of circles that are these services implemented in the field programmable gate array. And at the bottom, the little green dots are your microservices, and they're communicating to the FPGA across a standard PCIe bus, where the hardware is running those services at the top, at the direction of the microservices at the bottom, which are running in software. And with this relationship, you get a very efficient flow of data. And as Neil pointed out, we're breaking the big monolithic application into smaller chunks. Those chunks are pipeline across multiple cores. They're doing things in parallel. And that's one of the areas where FPGAs excel at, is doing parallel operations. And this gives you an example of how that parallelization works. CPU is running. It's sitting there running some kind of processing load, and it's doing a certain number of operations per second. All of a sudden, let's spin up the FPGA. Now, it's running all those hardware offloaded processes. You're doing things in parallel, and it's doing across the network. It's doing the storage at the direction of the CPU. So the CPU is free to do more of its own work at this point. And then a lot of these systems, especially where you're trying to do AI operations, which maybe figuring out which TCP protocol that you want to switch to. You're monitoring network conditions. You're running AI algorithms for network data collection. So you want to be able to directly feed that GPU. We're reconfigurable hardware. If that's what you need, we'll add a path in to directly feed the GPU data and keep it busy without loading down the CPU. So given all of this, what's our return on investment for putting in special reconfigurable hardware? Well, the, the main one is that we make each server many times more efficient. You get higher IO ops. We've seen cases where we can hit 10x the performance of the operations per second by offloading these things that are causing CPU churn on the same CPU models. Obviously, that results in lower power usage and smaller physical space. 
we're looking at putting edge servers in locations where you may only have room for a single box or maybe two of a one or two U unit. It's, it's maybe sitting out in the field at the base of a cell tower. You've got to get the power down, and you've got to get the efficiency of the server running. And if you follow those three rules of reconfigurable hardware, then you can do this without causing harm to the way you develop software. You don't have to change your business practices. You don't have to retrain your programmers. It's just a different API, and in some cases, a very similar API to what you're already using, but you get the advantages of hardware acceleration. So let's talk about a specific embodiment of what I've just spoke about, and that's our product, the Stream Processing Unit. It's a physical PCIe card, I happen to have show and tell, um, that plugs into a standard Dell R640 or R740 or whatever server that, that's appropriate for your uh, deployment. And we have put the IP that we've worked on over the last seven years that does the things that I just spoke about. So from this card, we can offload all the TCP IP protocols. We can offload TLS. We can terminate that inside the chip here, do the analysis on the data, and then feed the microservices with the results of that analysis. And one example of that is HTTP header processing. So in a lot of CDN cases, you've got to figure out for the request which customer it came from, manipulate the URL to a common form, determine whether it's sitting there on your local cache, or go hit the origin for it. It's a lot of thrashing, a lot of processing. But imagine if your microservice just received the result of that. Here's the HTTP header, here's the rule that it matches, and then you can go to town. And if you do that, your processing efficiency goes up. The other thing that we've implemented in here is a hardware object store. So as I talked about, the containers move from server to server, and they don't have consistent view of storage on the local box, so they need to hit a global storage so they can run on any box without worrying about where the data resides. What we did is we bus master all of the NVMe drives in the system. We make a coherent shared view of that storage across all the machines in the node, and no matter which microservice runs on it, when it asks for an object, it gets that object, whether it's local on that machine or on another machine in the node. And the way we do that request looks like a standard AWS or Azure cloud-based HTTP put-get protocol. It just matches what their programmers are already used to doing to hit the cloud. So this is going to be kind of more of a virtualized case study, something you can do with this, and that's a, a, a common software that you're implementing and that's a content cache. We already had talks today about caching and cache networks and all this kind of stuff. This is how we would implement a content cache if we were using the hardware that we have. And I won't go into details about a content cache because it's not all the talks, we actually know what, what they are. So the types of things that we want to run in the content cache, the core logic of the cache, the business decisions will sit in the CPU. The stream processing unit, our card, will run the clustered blob store, clustered table store, do all the network offload, the virtual switching, the HTTP header matching, inter-process communication, logging, diagnostics, all of that is now in hardware, which means that the content cache can process requests much more quickly. So we can run it as a container because we can handle the overhead of a containerization of a content cache application. So it can be managed using those orchestration layers. We can hit full line rate 40 gigabit per second for this particular card variant and 200,000 IO ops per second on the content cache. Low CPU, low power. Our cache is actually stored in the NVMe drives because we're fast enough to serve over 118 gigabits per second of random access from five NVMe drives, all offloaded in hardware. So we can handle 200,000 requests per second of small content chunks on a single card on a single one use server. Uh, and we can restart without losing the cache because it's persistent on the drive. So if you need to take the machine down for a firmware upgrade or maintenance or switch it over to do something else and then back, you don't lose your cache. You don't have to hit the origin server again. Uh, it's still using APIs for the software, so it's easy to develop. It can be managed dynamically. And we've seen, based on some of the other content cache software that's out there, that we're 10x more efficient on the IO ops per second for a single one use server. And uh, we have a partner of ours that's actually using our technology uh, this, uh, that I want to mention is another case study, and this uh, is a company called Streaming Global. So, Richard, you want to come up? Sure. I don't know where the mic is. On the... There you go. Yeah. 
So streaming global is going to be an example, uh, I guess, where theory meets practice uh, in all of the amazing things that Brent just talked about. Um, and very similar to what Neil was talking about before, um, streaming global um, had a business reason to um, revisit the conventional streaming pipeline. Basically, we, re we reimagined that pipeline for what today's internet has become, as it was so eloquently shared by both Neil <laughs> and Brent. Um, he was the eloquent one. <laughs> okay. We, uh, basically, we created a, a streaming technology that decouples uh, a lot of the ingest functions that are currently um, causing a lot of the processing and cost on the front end server for live streaming. And then we also decoupled a lot of the stream out services on the back end of the cloud. Um, and it really left um, both live and on demand serving as mostly a storage centric function. So no longer is live more processor centric. Now we can deliver both as a storage centric um, capability. Uh, and we obviously having the ability to do live streaming at low latency over just cloud storage over standard HTTP, you know, RESTful API to cloud storage, uh, it was kind of a match made in heaven when we found out about Hellastorm because they hardware accelerate cloud storage in a way that nobody in the industry can do. Uh, so we basically became one of those test subjects for a microservice as described by Brent. Uh, which was then hardware accelerated by Hellastorm's hardware. Uh, and by doing that, we were able to create a live streaming service that's basically running on your FPGA hardware directly through uh, a Dell rack mount storage server. Um, no other ingest server required, no specific stream out server required. Um, that's all right. We did a we had already created a, a really fast streaming technology when we, uh, when we reimagined the pipeline. Uh, but when we put it through Hellastorm's hardware, um, the numbers just became really, really fast. We did a public demo together uh, at the beginning of last week in front of a large audience where we did a live stream mobile to mobile through a data center a few cities away at stable 0.6 seconds of live latency end to end. Um, and here, I've got a mobile demo with me. I keep it in my pocket. Uh, <laughs> so if you guys want to see a sub-second live stream mobile to mobile, now our data center is still in Atlanta. It's still. So yeah. we're actually demoing it here at the show uh, in the hallways, in the meeting rooms, uh, through this hardware, just because uh, I believe showing it is the best way to, to give an example of the actual discussion points that Brent mentioned, but in practice. Uh, and so far, all of the demos we've done here have been right at about uh, 0 0.9, 1 point seconds, all the way to Atlanta and back. And the main thing that we, to express from our standpoint is that's a great service. It's amazing how quickly and stable live is and what we've done with the partnership is made the ability to deploy that less expensive. So you get a quicker return on the investment because from a single server, we can handle over 20,000 live streams at the lower bit rate and 10,000 at HD quality and do that at somewhere around 250 watts or less. And that makes it where you can build out these deployments for smaller vendors who, do, who don't want to send it out to the public cloud. They can actually afford now to do it themselves. So. That's it, we think there's a lot more things you can do with this type of uh, technology. We think it's gonna be in every server at the edge because it just makes sense. It's the only way you can get that scale and the efficiency change. And we think a, a solution like the Heliform, Helistorm SPU with the IP wrapped into services and following those three laws is the easiest way for you to do it without having to build specialized hardware teams. So thank you very much and we'll open the floor up to questions. Right, how are we doing for questions, folks? Any questions? Okay, as is inevitable, I have one. <laughs> so um, I, was, was, I was fascinated when Intel launched their GPUs inside their chipsets, and it really, I think that changed a lot of dynamics in our sector. So seeing FPGA emerging, I think that's another mm -hmm. generation of that, and I think that's very exciting. Something I haven't had time to play with FPGA yet, and I know it's a dark art 
practiced by people in dark rooms with... with a lot of goats have lost their it's lives. It's very yeah. strange, yeah. Um, so I have, but you're at least... You, Typically barbecue. At least you have the crystal ball or some means <laughs> to communicate with them. But, uh, but something I don't understand. If, you, if you're running FPGA in a multi-tenant environment mm -hmm. and you have somebody wanting to, say, deploy, uh, I don't know, uh, some TCP offloading in, uh, into it or somebody else wanting to do some security certificates, somebody else maybe wanting to deploy codec into it, which I understand is, is architecturally possible if not already done, does, does it take time to change the process that's on it in between each user request? How does that deployment work? It, it does. So the traditional FPGA hardware accelerator typically only did one, does one thing. So if you're running an OpenCL application or an HLS application using a standard FPGA card that you drop in your system, when you load that, that's what it does. The difference in what we're proposing is that those services are all there all the time. So when you run a micro container and you hit the API, it hits that service, there's no loading, it's instantaneous. So you're doing network offload, at the same time you're able to do the, the hardware object store or any of the cloud services. Now, we've left a great deal of gates in the FPGA open for customer specific dynamic modules and those are a slightly different workflow. In that flow, when you load your container, one of the rules in the container, besides just how much RAM it needs and how many CPU cores and storage, would be that it needs this associated hardware persona. And if it's already loaded in the FPGA, then the orchestration layer will drop it in that box. If not, it will spin that persona up in one of the unused blocks in the FPGA. And that process is milliseconds, so it's not gonna impact That's the time it needs to run the container. And it, every FPGA will be able to run you know, two or three or four personas depending on the size of the FPGA. Fantastic. So that's the, our vision for how that would work. Perfect, cool, any other questions, guys? Okay, well, look, let's, uh, we're gonna, uh, another round of applause for, for the Hellstone <laughs> Man. Thanks for being a great sponsor. Sure.